Okay, everyone, this is Michael Camo from Minionville, and I'm here with Sean Udall. He's the author of Minionville's TechStrat Report. He is our go-to guy on tech stocks. So if you've got questions about Apple, Facebook, Twitter, IPO, anything, he's here to answer them. You can put them in the chat. As a reminder, we will be recording this, so it will be available on YouTube. Um, and we will send you an email, so you don't even have to worry about asking us. You will get a reminder. You'll be able to watch it again. So we are going to jump right in. Now, Sean, um, we, we showed this slide last time. Why don't you very, very quickly go through um, the bull case for tech? Yeah, well, and, and this is more of a long-term thematic bull case. That, that could happen, and I, I kind of foresee this because I see the environment similar right now to what we had from sort of the mid to early late 90s. So you basically have a situation where everybody knows the U.S. is, is sort of the best house in the bad neighborhood, and, and tech is probably the, the, the best house in the, be the better neighborhood. Um, and you just got really good, you know, revenue and earnings growth relative to valuation in, throughout the space. Um, you also do have a lot of companies that are, that are showing very good return on equity. Um, so you get superior uh, return on equity in, in what I believe is going to be a rising inflation, inflation world. And I added one thing from the last time. You know, everybody talks about black swans, potential black swans, negative outcomes, things like that. Uh, nobody ever talks about sort of a crazy upside black swan. Um, and the longer we stay at a zero interest rate policy, the, 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 the greater the odds I think we actually could have sort of one of those stupid upside black swan type, type events. Uh, I'm not convinced we're going to have that, but that, that could be the case. Everybody knows the macro, and right now the debt debate is the macro that's rearing, rearing its head. So that's, that's really all I have to say on that. But that, this is not a one-quarter sort of deal. This is like a, a one to a three year time frame at least. Okay, um, why don't we step back. From a bigger picture perspective, um, you go back to the 80s and the stock market was kind of dominated by um, you know, big consumer companies like Procter & Gamble and Coke and Pepsi mm -hmm. Nabisco were and tobacco companies were growing very, very quickly. Do you think tech has kind of replaced that leadership? You know, instead well, of, um, I, I, I think, think it you know, could. Of I, Apple and Facebook. Yeah, I, I mean, you know, you take a couple companies, but but I think it could. I mean, it, you know, it, the difference is that tech usually doesn't run in 15 to 20 year cycles like some other industries do. I mean, the oil industry, you could argue, just basically had a 10 to a 15 year cycle. Gold had almost a 15 year cycle. Tech tends to have shorter product cycles, so sort of the 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 long tail cycles for tech are probably more than the four and a half to like seven year time frames. But yeah, I mean, there, there always has to be one or two sectors in the market that lead. And um, coming out of the bottom in 2008, the, the finance stocks were, were the best performing stocks. Um, and then, you know, tech's been there, healthcare, biotech has been crazy the last 18 months. But so, so let's just, this is the last point kind of on macro. If you look at the late 90s, biotech by far outperformed everything to about the middle of 98, 99. And then what happened is there was this huge, huge catch-up move in tech, and biotech kind of was flat to down. Um, and it's very, very interesting that now we're in the long tail of this Fed zero interest rate policy that it's sort of all happening again. In some ways it's good, in some ways it's kind of scary, but it's, it's easier to figure out how to trade and how to invest if you at least know some history. Okay, we are going to uh, move on then. Now, um, these are, these are going to be our big topics for today. We're going to be talking Google and Apple, uh, smartphone market share, takeover targets, PC cycle, as you can see. Um, we'll also revisit Facebook, which was a big hit from the last webcast. Stock closed at 26.55 that day. The day we held that webcast, it was up 30%. Two days later, now it's over 50, and we will get to that later. So um, yep. let's get into the big guns, Google and Apple. Yep. Now, what's the trade right now with Google and Apple? Well, you know, the, in 2012, I was pounding the table basically to sell Apple, but pretty much anything over 600, 625. I was like, sell, sell Apple by Google. Google was, you know, 550 or lower at the time. Apple was 600 or higher at the time. And so right now, I basically think it's sort of the opposite trade. Now, Google still may be my favorite long-term large cap stock on, on, let's say, a two, three, four-year time frame or more. Although I don't know. Right now, I'm seeing some things in the food chain which maybe would change my opinion. Certainly for the next, I'd say, two to three quarters, if not four to five quarters, I, I'm definitely weighting Google or uh, Apple much more over Google. So I think Apple, the great disruptor, is back. I think 64-bit is, is absolutely huge. 
I, I personally hadn't used an iPhone for about two years. Uh, I thought the Android technology for the same price point or even a hundred bucks cheaper price point was quite a bit better. Um, and I do think, I mean, Apple's just completely raised the bar again with 64-bit, superior screen, re screen resolution, on and on and on. And I think iOS 7 is, is literally that good. So, you know, uh, so, some of the negatives on Google over the years have been Android fragmentation, some of these other things. And they really didn't matter because the, the, the power of the Android cycle was just that strong. And if you remember a few years ago when Android was at 3 to 5%, I said Android was going to hit 70% market share greater. It actually hit 79% market share last quarter. Um, but so, so everything that sort of worked in Android's favor and hurt Apple, I think is kind of going to come full circle. Uh, I've written a lot about what I think is Samsung fatigue. Um, and really, if I, if I go back now, now that you have iOS 7, now that you have 64-bit, the, the only real advantage of a lot of higher-end Android phones is the fact that they come in 4.7 and 5-inch screens and larger. And if, if, if the only thing holding up market share is a big screen phone, Apple can easily destroy that. So they, they can come out with one or two different screen sizes and uh, have a massive, massive, massive share take. And I've written, you know, volumes on that. That I that basically it's happening, and I think it's going to happen. Okay. Um, well, let me let me give you a question then. Um, I think we all remember two to three years ago. It seemed like every single Android phone that came out was hot. I remember waiting two months for an HTC Droid Incredible. Sure. Now we're we're seeing um, HTC, LG, Sony, Samsung. Everyone. I feel like there's always there's a new flagship Android phone out every month it seems. Is there too many of those? And do there, you might be, but, but, there might be, but if you really think about what's happened, and I, again, I've been all over this, so the best selling Android phones hands down, and again, I, I'm, I'm not talking about the $100 phones that sell 10 million units in China. I'm talking about the stuff that people actually make money on. So, But the best selling Android phones have always been the Nexus Android phone, right? So when HTC was number one, they were making the Nexus phone. And then, and then Samsung had a huge, I mean, Samsung has made like three or four Nexus devices. Well, what I think is going to happen, I think is, is already happening, is that the next great Nexus phone is going to be a Motorola phone. So now there might be multiple Nexus phones. By the way, LG made a Nexus phone. They went from nowhere in market share. They literally doubled their phone sales because they had the, the Nexus 4. Um, so, so the LG Android sales were up over 100% on, on that Nexus device. So I think what's going to happen is the Nexus phone will still be the good selling Android phone, but that will really be the only one that people seek seek out. So and that's going to be Motorola devices. I mean, a Motorola Razor is basically a Nexus device, but the official next Nexus phone is going to be uh, a Motorola phone. It's the Moto X, in fact. Oh, so, so I think you're get, you're going to have Apple and you're going to have Motorola, and they're going to squeeze everybody else in a great big vice. Okay. So now, do you so do you think the Moto X will be a big seller for Motorola? slash Google? Yeah, it'll be great. It'll be fantastic. It, it, and again, it probably will be, it probably will be the only, people will talk about sort of the demise of Android, and really, it just will be that Android just can't grow market share anymore. Uh, and Apple will steal, and we'll get to market share in a sec, but Apple will steal some good points of market share. But the bottom line is Motorola share is going to increase hugely. Uh, should be good for Google. Um, and then the, the rest of the Android makers, unless, unless there's like five different Nexus phones, which I don't think there's going to be, I think the rest are going to have trouble. Okay, and uh, these two companies that Apple will destroy, um, can you identify those? Yeah, Pandora, which I'm short, and Netflix, which I want to be short again, but I'm smart enough to stay out of the way at the moment. But yeah, uh, I mean, I think I think the, the Apple iRadio pr uh, product is very, very good. It's officially called Apple iTunes Radio. Um, I, I've actually, I, my, my Pandora listening has dropped by 50%, if not more, since I started listening to uh, to Apple iTunes Radio, um, I, so so you just put two and two together. Um, now Pandora is still going to be the the main listening device for radio over Android phones, but like in the U.S. and the larger markets, and I think Pandora is only in a couple big markets. Uh, you know, uh, 50 to 60 percent of their listening occurs over a, an iOS device. So yeah, I think I think Apple's going to destroy. Now again, that doesn't mean these guys will disappear but I would not want to be long those two stocks over the next uh, four to five quarters. Okay, well said. So we are going to move on to the market share question. So um, as you said, um, 
Android right now is about 79-80% globally, Apple's 13-14%. Now, where do you see it? Why don't you talk about where you see that going? Yeah, and we don't need to spend a lot of time on this because we've kind of covered a little bit. But basically, I think I think Androids are uh, Apple's for sure going to gain share for three to four quarters. Now, if I'm right on the fact that I believe they're going to have at least one really nice 4.7 inch device, they might even have more than one. They might have a phablet, uh, and they might have two or three phone sizes. If if they come out like that, and the iPhone 6 is tremendous, and it comes in two or three screen sizes, you could see Apple gain share for maybe even up to two years. Um, I, th I think in the U.S. you're going to you're they, they could get back to 50 percent share. They're about 40 right now, and I think they could get again to between 45 and 50 percent. Most of the developed I call them the discerning markets. Um, and then right now, you know, uh, I, I I think it, the the Asian markets, and again, where people can only afford really really cheap devices, that's still going to be an Android a stronghold. But that still there should be enough share take to get uh, Apple to increase share by you know anywhere from five to seven points globally. That's a big deal. That's a big needle mover. Uh, and again, th there's you know there's there's more to it, but I think the big screen phones is gonna is gonna really hurt the high end of the Android food chain. So again, we kind of cover that that. But again, I, I see a big big share take. By the way, the share take is already occurring. What's really interesting is I didn't really think much of the share take was gonna happen until until we got the new phone, until we got iOS seven. But really, for the last three or four months. Um, uh, iOS share has been increasing anyway uh, in the U.S. And, and, and through parts of Europe. So it's a, the, the share take has already started increasing uh, before iOS 7 and before the new uh, big screen phone comes. Oh, okay, um, so one, uh, as a quick aside, so do you think Microsoft has any place here? Um, l let's say two years out, where do you think Windows Phone fits in here, or do you think they'll be out of the market? Boy, that's a really good question. They, they, you know, they could be out of the market. The thing is about, about about Microsoft. Do they have enough money? They could fund losing devices for a long, long time. So my guess is they probably won't be out of the market. You know, Windows Phone is gaining share. They're gaining share in Europe. They're gaining share in Asia. Um, I don't know if if they're making any money at all off of it. And and the difference, you know, the beauty of Android is Google. Google doesn't need the the, the Android makers to really make much money. Um, they just need a lot, a lot of people using Google search and Google technology and Android phones all over the world, and they do great. Um, the problem with Microsoft is I don't really see that they have a tertiary strategy. So if, if they're not making money on the phone, they're not going to make much money on Bing. I, I just, you know, I don't think people are going to buy $99 office mobility suites or how much ever they cost. And I, I, I just don't see a Microsoft App Store really taking off. So. I kind of think it's dead on arrival, to be honest. I, I, ne I never was a big believer in Windows phones, although I did think Windows tablets could do okay, and I still think there might be a kind of a Hail Mary chance, but I just don't think Windows, I mean, they might have a number three market share place in the world, but I don't know if that really gets them anything. Um, okay, and uh, as a quick aside, uh, BlackBerry, uh, what about them? Do you think they're just going to be kind of carved up into pieces? And I do, I do. So this is sort of, it's like my, my ultimate nightmare. Again, I hit this stock really, really well early, early in the year. I, I smartly took a big chunk of it off, but I stupidly didn't sell the whole thing. But I, but I still got to believe, again, I could be wrong. I, I still think there's sort of like anywhere from eleven fifty to $14 in value there. Um, in fact, today I, I just missed. I was going to buy some at 750, um, and some rumors came out, and it popped right, right, right to eight bucks. Um, but I, you know, I wouldn't put much money into it. I, it's a small position for me, but I do. I think it's going to be carved up. I mean, basically, I think it's still worth six billion bucks or more. I think they got two billion in patents, two billion in cash, and I think the network operation center is worth about two billion bucks. So the problem is, if it's a, just a nasty, nasty distress sale. They might not get those values out of it. So I mean, it's if they if they sell for nine bucks, it just shows how how dumb they are. Because because two years ago they should start making Android phones and they would have been fine. Um, they never decided to make Android phones, which again I'm just flabbergasted every day that goes by that they didn't come to that decision. Um, but yeah, I mean they're basically uh, they're going to go the way of the dodo bird and and get taken out by somebody. Okay, and. Um Okay, so we are going to move on to uh, M and A. Who's next? And um, yeah. first name is Fusion IO, which to me seems like like a no-brainer. So um, in the past, you said you doubted they would sell. So what's different now? 
Well, I doubted they would sell, or put it this way, I didn't want them to sell. I thought the company had much more potential, but they, you know, I, I, they've been, they've, they've struggled more than I thought they were going to. Um, but some other people have kind of put the squeeze on them and really lowered price points in certain things. What's really interesting now, though, and the reason I welcome a deal now, is that Western Digital has been really aggressive in buying almost every really good Fusion I.O. competitor. And they just bought sort of the leading private competitor just a couple weeks ago. And at this point, there's just, there's really no quality companies in this space anymore that are public or even in the private channel. They've basically all been bought. I mean, if, if in fact, a really brilliant strategy, if Western Digital bought FIO, they darn near corner the market in this particular vertical. Um, I don't think Seagate and I don't think a, a couple other companies will let them do that. Um, so, so I think actually the odds of a buyout have increased um, ever since Western Digital made the, the last acquisition that they made. So I think Fusion IO gets going. I, I, I still really strongly believe that they do have the best technology in the space, but it's just it's just tough. You know, it's tough for companies of that size to really hold the technology advantage. And there, there's something weird that happened there. The, the two founders either got pushed out or they got something weird happened, and that, that probably lost some, they lost some steam because of that. Um, so there, there's been a fair number of software deals already this year. One thing that's kind of popped up on my radar is Tibco. That's T-I-B-X. Um, they actually had a pretty good quarter. And, and what I've been noticing, too, especially in the last year and a half, is that companies don't get sold when they should. In other words, a big company with a lot of cash and a lot of muscle should come in and buy these things when they've just had two terrible quarters in a row. But what happens is it's, it's sort of like the, the, you know, the big corporate buyers are no smarter than the momentum buyers, right? It's like they want to see a stock rise and they want to see a company put up two or three good quarters and then it seems like somebody comes along and buys somebody at a premium when in fact they could have bought somebody you know, for 35 or 50 percent cheaper a year earlier. But, but so Tibco just had a decent quarter. They kind of been struggling for a while. If they have another good quarter, I, you know, I think their, their, their odds of getting buy out, bought out actually go up. Uh, I put Aruba, Bronsoft, and Radware kind of as a triumvirate right there. I, I don't know who gets bought out in that space, but, but in sort of this, this tertiary bandwidth space, um, where companies are trying to try to really help people increase wireless uh, connectivity and and manage those connections, I think that some somebody in that space is 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 going to get taken out or multiple companies. Um, and then we already talked about BlackBerry, so we won't cover. All, all I'm going to say is if if they get bought by nine bucks by Prema um, up there in Canada, he's he's stealing it. I mean he he he'll buy that thing for nine bucks and he'll end up making at least fifty percent on those assets. Um, so, so I would, I, I would be, I'd say there's at least a 50% chance that that a higher bid comes comes along. But I used to think, my, I used to think, you know, BlackBerry could potentially get bought for between, I don't know, 17 to 22 dollars or something like that, maybe even a little higher. Uh, and at this point, there's just no, a big bid like that is unfortunately not going to come along. And then, you know, there could even be more more deals. But but those are just some names that kind of come to my mind that uh, could could be in the M&A crosshairs. Okay, uh, we're going to move on in a moment. I'd just like to remind everyone, if you have questions, please put them in the chat, and we will get to them. Okay, so um, PC cycle, numbers have been terrible across the board. Now, you've talked about 64-bit before, so how is that really a game changer? Well, I think it's a, it's a, it's a huge game changer, but here's, here's the big deal. So, so the big deal is, first of all, you, you know, Apple has it. The, the Apple ecosystem is very tight from end to end. All the app developers, it's very easy for them to reprogram their apps or rewrite their apps and be sort of instantly compatible and they work well on 64-bit devices that Apple is going to start selling. They have one right now. So, but, but if you really think about it, it just allows for a lot better processing speed, a lot more efficient power usage. It's, it's sort of like when computing went from 32 to 64-bit years ago, right? Um, and, and in fact, that was sort of the last. That was sort of the last growth cycle for the PCs is when they went to 64-bit architecture. So, but what, what's what? What else is this is going to do? Is going to put this huge this huge difference in the efficiency and the use of of, of DRAM. So, for example, 64-bit works and it works fine under four four gig. Um, but I think what what happens is once you go to four gig and over. 
um, the 64-bit technology really, really takes off. So um, that's why I put Micron in there. Um, you know, they, right now they basically sell you know 1G into a bunch of devices. Well, all of a sudden, if devices go from 1G to not 2, but from 2 to 4 or 4 and higher, uh, it's, it's going to be crazy. I mean, I think we all remember when you know computers worked really well on a half a gig of memory, and now if you you know if you don't have 4 gig to 8 gig, they basically don't work. Um, so the bottom line is I think I, you're going to see that whole evolution take place, place in mobile devices. And what we're ultimately going to hand is have is something that fits in the palm of our hands that basically has almost like laptop computing power. It's probably not that far away. I mean, I could argue right now that the next generation iPad is probably going to blow people away from how much computing power it has. Um, so, but anyway, so, so ARM, it, it just kills me that I said, woe is me. I mean, uh, I was all over ARM when it was a $27 stock. In fact, I really liked ARM when it was a $7 to $14 stock back when, you know, in, in, the, in the depths of the, uh, of the financial crisis. Uh, the stock is in the high 40s now, um, and they're basically, you know, sort of the, 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 the big gun in 64-bit technology architecture. Um, again, I think Micron's going to really benefit from 64-bit, and I've been on Micron. This has been a very nice name. Unfortunately, I haven't had very much of it, but I've talked quite a bit about it since it was uh, like 10 to 12 bucks and cheaper. Um, Intel, I think this is both good and bad for. I think, I think Intel really needs to embrace becoming a fabrication company. And people, if they if they sign up, and my old subs know this. I mean, I've talked about the the potential for Intel as a fab. So they're just what what 64-bit does for mobility is it just really really raises the bar on the amount of computing power you can fit in a device. And I think it's going to be a huge deal. And put it this way, it just it just makes buying and using and buying new PCs and buying new laptops sort of that um, less necessary, right? So so you're already seeing that that. PC sales are really struggling, the more powerful uh, phones get and the more powerful tablets get, it just makes it harder and harder to go out there and, and put harder money down on, on new computers. Um, oh, okay, um, let's go to an audience question since we're on this topic. Uh, what do you think of Qualcomm here? You know, I don't mind Qualcomm. I mean, Qualcomm is sort of a really good steady eddy. Um, I, I, I do think Qualcomm is... is the, Qualcomm almost does better when Android is really flying and Apple's struggling a little bit, because yes, Apple's a good customer for Qualcomm, but Qualcomm really almost—they don't have as much content in an Apple device as they do in some in, in quite a few Android devices. So I like Qualcomm. I think Qualcomm's a very good name. You can you can own it. You can put it away. Uh, you can write calls on it. It's not going to hurt you very badly. And and they uh, they have a mountain of cash too. They're one of these gorgeous companies with these great stockpiles of cash. But I don't. It's it's not as an exciting of a growth story as it was a couple years ago when I was pounding the table on it between like 35 and 42 bucks. Um, their their day may come, but I think we're going to see maybe Qualcomm will have to do something different. Um, maybe they have to buy somebody. They they might have to buy some growth. Um, but what, what Qualcomm could kind of end up like Apple was for the last year or so, where great company, great balance sheet, tons of cash, but they go into like a three to a four quarter slower growth cycle. Okay, uh, we're going to move on then. So let's talk about IPOs. Um, now, F-E-Y-E, -E, that is, that, is that FireEye? Yeah, it is. It's FireEye. It just came out. In fact, there was uh, Rocket Fuel and FireEye came out on the same day. And Rocket Fuel is Fuel, F-U-E-L. It's one of the coolest stock symbols I've ever seen. Um, the, the work I've been doing, though, is I'm thinking, now, again, I'm, I'm going to write some stuff up on this probably in the coming uh, two to three weeks. But I, I, I was all over Splunk, and um, I thought Splunk is, was going to be just, a, just an unbelievable stock, and it has been. Um, and even though Splunk looked really expensive in the first quarter or two, it was public. I, I, I basically thought it was cheap because I, I knew they would grow into their valuation. Well, FireEye is sort of the same thing. And what FireEye basically has is they have technology that resides in virtual machines and at the core of the cloud. So the way they detect um, viruses and threats, security threats and things like that, is really a different, a, a different type of technology. Uh, and they actually have a very, very good customer base. So I'm, I'm digging into FireEye. And, and I can't say they're going to be the next Splunk right now, but, but I'm kind of leaning that way, and I'll be doing work, more work on them. But from what I've seen so far, they're really interesting. I mean, I, I wish they were 10 bucks cheaper and I'd own some, but 
I'm kind of hoping they might catch like a, you know, just something weird happens and, and you know, they take five or six points out of the stock for, for basically no reason. Um, so let, let's, let's talk about Twitter though. So, so I set it right here. I think what, <laughs> if you go back, you know, and you talk about what happened to Facebook on the IPO, right? And Mike, we, we talk, they priced it too high. It was a messy first day of trading. You know, we, we could talk about all the kind of problems that Facebook had at the initial public offering. I think everything that Facebook did wrong, or let's just say that befell them, whether it was a fault of theirs or not, I think it's going to be 180 degrees different for Twitter. Um, I think, I think Twitter is going to leave some in the bag. So I think if people do get IPO shares, they're going to love them. It's, they're going to go up huge. Um, and I just, I kind of think you just won't see the nightmare scenario that happened to Facebook will happen to Twitter. And by the way, I've always said, I've always said, even a couple years ago, if and when Twitter comes public, it will make all the rest of these social stocks uh, look like jump change. So I think that they're going to suck a lot of market cap and market value from a bunch of people. I think Yelp, LinkedIn, maybe Facebook a little bit, maybe they even hurt Google a little bit. I don't know. We'll see. I, I think Twitter, I, I mean, I am just praying. I'm praying that it doesn't open and trade at a 30 to $40 valuation, billion dollar valuation, you know, the first day. I mean, I, I hope somehow it's, you know, 18 to 24 billion or less. Um, and, but, but I, you know, we talked about this too. Whatever it comes out at, whatever it's trading at in the first, I don't know, five minutes, 10 minutes, hour, I'm going to buy some. Now that some, that some might be 20 shares. I mean, it might be a very small amount, but I'm going to own some. And then I'm going to hope somehow, some way it gets hit and it gets cheaper and I can buy more. But, but I, I firmly believe that, uh, that Twitter is going to really surprise people. And, and maybe we get a little reprieve, you know. They could, try to, they could try to tone down some of the uh, fervor by some of the statements that they make. Maybe they talk about the fact that growth is sort of slow, blah, blah, blah. Um, I, I really hope something negative comes out on it and makes it cheaper. But the bottom line is I think, I think Twitter is going to be as good as the Facebook IPO has been from when Facebook finally got cheap. I think Facebook or Twitter is going to be good from the first day. I think, I think it's going to be a lot more like Google, in fact. Okay. Um, so we are going to move on. Um, so let's go. So we can get to the um, Q and A. Can you just quickly go through um, where you see the market going in, and let's say the top two or three names into year end? Yeah. Well, I mean, as I say, I, I hope Twitter comes early in the fourth quarter. I, I don't know when it comes, but if Twitter comes in the fourth quarter, I'm definitely going to be in Apple. I'm definitely going to be in Twitter. And I jokingly kind of say, if you have Apple and Twitter, do you need anything else? It's sort of like years ago I wrote a blog about uh, if you own you know, Google and, and Apple and Berkshire Hathaway, you pretty much don't need anything else. So, so right now I'm kind of hoping Twitter comes out early in the fourth quarter. Let's keep our fingers crossed. I don't know if it's going to or not, though. Um, as far as a lot of other things, I, I still like the fiber bandwidth story quite a bit. Um, but a lot of these stocks, you know, these have been stocks I've been on. A lot of them are up literally 100% from where they were a year ago. So I kind of need to see some EPS reports in the coming quarter. Um, to sort of validate the, the momentum that's happened the last, uh, you know, four to five months. Um, but I do think, in fact, security, uh, I didn't say, I mean, security, I think, could be the next super cycle in technology. Um, and we really haven't had a super cycle in technology. I guess you could say social and mobility have been. Um, but again, I still, like, I still think the need for fiber and bandwidth connectivity is not a multi-quarter story, it's a multi-year story. Um, so anyway, that, that's about it. I think basically, if you kind of look at my top ten to top twenty list, um, I still like most of the names. I've I've, uh, I've I've kind of peeled off some, but the bottom line, uh, yeah, I've increased Apple, I've decreased some other things. I'm hoping to catch some Twitter, um, and I think again, fiber bandwidth security, I think is going to be okay. Uh, and by the way, all those three sectors, if you look at them relative to healthcare relative to biotech or relative to a Zillow, a Yelp, a LinkedIn, all these really overvalued names. Um, you know, I, I think a lot of that stuff is valued okay. Um, and then in moving on here, we can talk about, uh, you know, I think we just, I think it was worth mentioning Facebook. I don't know, Mike, if you want to add anything here. Yeah, I'll, um, give, I'll, I'll give you an uh, audience. Um, this is my used car salesman pitch. Uh, last <laughs> webinar, Sean Udall, he said you need to be in Facebook because of mobile. The stock closed at 26.55 that day. Like three days later, mobile revenue shot up to 41%. They beat 
revenues by 15%. Stocks up 100% since then. Um, we're going to get to the Q&A. So uh, very quickly, Sean, what is the trade on Facebook right now? And where do you see it in three months and, let's say, 12 months? Yeah, I mean, I still think the stock goes higher. Uh, yeah, I've been interviewed by a few people about what I think about Facebook. I mean, they still, they're still going to go to 50% of total revenues from mobile, and they're going to go over 50%. I still think the name can work higher, but I just there's no way I can like the stock as much now as I did when it was 25 bucks and cheaper. Um, so, I mean, I've, I've sold some. I've sold some into this lift. Uh, I still have some. I mean, everybody talks, oh, Facebook can go to 55 or 57. I mean, if I think about where Facebook could go two or three years from now, you know, it, it could go up quite a bit more, maybe it could double again. Um, in the next three months, I, I, still think it, I still think it's got to see 55 to 65 bucks. Um, but they do have to deliver. This, this next quarter is very interesting because if they only beat by a penny and they don't guide up much, well, they don't give guidance, but if they don't, if they don't sort of elude that business momentum is still strong and things like that, um, they, could, they could take a, a good chunk out of the stock. But see, I, th this is one of those names I would relish a, like a 15% pullback or more in the stock. And then, then I would build back up something closer to my former position. Um, but again, bottom line, I, I think I still, I mean, at the end of the day, for the next one, three, maybe even five years, Google is going to still have the, the number one position in Internet advertising. Facebook's going to have number two. Everybody else is going to have a hard time even showing up on the radar. Apple may come into this picture, by the way. Um, and in fact, that's one of my long-term thesis points. But I think the bottom line is, if you, if you look long-term, it's still going to be Google number one, Facebook number two. Everybody else is going to be fighting for the rest. And I, I, I don't see that changing you know, for quite a while. OK. Um, OK, so now it is time for the Q&A. Uh, folks, final reminder, if you have questions, uh, please put them in the box. and. Um, the first question is, we have a lot of iPad questions. Um, do you think sure. Apple will actually make, uh, there's rumors about an iPad mini, do you ever see them making a bigger iPad? As in something, I guess the big one now is 10 inches, do you ever see anything bigger than that? Yeah, I think they will. I mean, they, they've already made the iPad mini. I mean, I think, uh, in fact, I saw a rumor that they were working on a 12-inch iPad. Um, so we'll see. I mean, I, th I think what they'll do They'll, it's, they're going to do what they're doing with the phones. They're going to they're have a size that they sort of believe is the best size. And so every new OS, every new phone, like, like the 5S, the iPad S, whatever, I mean, every new iteration, they're still going to keep that size they believe is ergonomically the best size. But then, you know, they're smart enough, they'll build some stuff around it. So it would not surprise me if they have a slightly bigger, in fact, I think you could see an iPad that's slightly bigger with, with a keyboard. And then why would you ever buy a Windows tablet? Um, okay, and related, um, lots of talk about an iWatch and Apple TV. Do you see those products of having um, iPad slash iPhone slash um, iPod, um, you know, I guess levels of relevance in the marketplace? Uh, well, let's take them one at a time. Okay, so the iWatch, I think, will be a huge, huge product. I think the, the beauty of an iWatch is it'll work with all the other stuff you have. So, so like, if you just if you're out there and you don't already own Apple products, like you don't have an i an iPhone, an iWatch might not be that great of a product. But if if you have an iPhone, I think your iWatch. And again, we talked about in this last webinar. I think Apple is going to allow people and allow companies to, or it's going to become the dominant OS and the dominant conduit for medical device monitoring, right? I think, I think everybody is totally missing this. I think, so, so you're gonna have the whole hospital industry, that people that get into medical device monitoring, it's all gonna be geared through the, the Apple ecosystem. So I think the iWatch is gonna be a really, really strong product to, to facilitate that. But yeah, I mean, I think an iWatch will, will come out and will have a, a, huge, a huge percent of the market share. A TV, I just don't know, I mean, I think, I think the underlying software, I mean, we're all sick of paying these huge, huge astronomical cable bills and feeling like we don't really get much out of it. So I think there, there's a huge potential for sort of a game-changing, um, what, what's the word, um, a disintermediation of, of sort of the television industry. Uh, if anybody can do it, I think Apple might be able to. But I've got to see a TV product before I get too excited. Like in all my, I just did a big earnings model on why I thought Apple could get to 800 to 875. I literally have nothing in that model for TV product. Um, so I'll, I'll sort of, I, I think it's coming. I, I believe it's coming. Um, I'll have to kind of wait and see what it is before I make judgments about it. But I do think an iWatch would be very, very good. Okay. Um, what are your thoughts on Tesla? 
I don't like Tesla. I think Tesla is a short. In fact, I'm really mad at myself because I was I was kind of tweeting about Tesla on Monday and about that. Uh, I was kind of thinking about looking at some puts, and I didn't do anything. And today they got cracked hard. Um, I'm not so sure. And by the way, but you know, if you would have asked me about Tesla two or three years ago, uh, I I would have liked it. Um, I in fact I kind of was feel feel very stupid. I didn't buy some between twenty five and thirty five dollars. Um, but the bottom line is, I mean, at this price, I, I don't think Tesla is the next Porsche. Um, I'm not sure how much of a technology that they're, put it this way, if you get Porsche, BMW, and Mercedes making electric cars, they're going to look just as good as the Teslas look, if not better, because I think Porsches look better than Teslas right now. Um, and, you know, we'll just see what happens. I, so I, I think it's kind of crazy. I, I you know, put it this way: I, if I do anything on the thing, I'm going to be short. And uh, but, but a lot of times it's just better to stay away. Um, but I'm, I'm not a fan of Tesla at these prices. Okay, um, what do you think of Groupon? I actually don't mind Groupon. Um, you know, I don't know if Groupon's going. Here's the really interesting thing about Groupon. I think we've actually had some Groupon questions before. For all of for for as much as Groupon has been maligned. No, and, and by the way, Google has a competing product. Lots of other people have competing products. Nobody's really been able to go in and create a product that sells well against Groupon. And I think if you utilize Groupon, which I do, I know a lot of people do, they do a really good job. So I think they have really good products at really good prices. And nobody's, I mean, Google's been competing hard against Groupon for over a year, and they haven't been able to crack them. So I actually, you know, this is when I actually had some Groupon earlier this year, and I I, I made an okay trade on it. I think I made 12 or 15 percent. I got out of it. I'm kind of kicking myself now. But I, I think Groupon works. I think it probably goes up. Again, I'd, I'm a dip buyer, so I'd rather buy it on a dip. But, but I, I probably like, put it this way, I like Groupon way more than Yelp. I like Groupon way more than Pandora. Yelp's a short in my book. I like Groupon way more than Tesla. I like Groupon way more than Zillow. So I, I, could, I could put Groupon ahead of a ton of, a ton of other hot stocks that I like way better than. Okay, uh, next question is, uh, do you think Carl Icahn will actually change anything at Apple? No, and in fact, you know, I, I'm kind of mixed on the whole Icahn thing. I, I, first of all, I, I don't really think Apple even needs to pay a dividend. I don't think Apple needs to do a $150 billion stock buyback. I even question whether they need to do a $60 billion stock buyback. I think that, so I'm old, you know, I've been in Apple, uh, you know, for hundreds of points. So, so I kind of believe that Apple just needs to do what Apple does best. Now, I have been very critical of Apple for a couple things. They should deploy cash in the same way of Berkshire Hathaway or IBM or Google. Okay, so I've been very critical that Apple has not used their cash as a strategic mergers and acquisition weapon. Uh, Apple should have a $10 billion hedge fund. They should have a $10 billion venture capital fund. They, they, they should have already bought uh, out 15 or 20 or 30 billion dollars of really good companies at really good prices. So the bottom line is I, I think the one thing Apple could do a lot better is invest their cash for higher returns. So I, I, I'm not, I don't think they shouldn't do a buyback. I think a buyback's a great idea. But you know, they should have been doing a buyback when the stock was between 70 and 100 and 150 and 200. So I mean, but, but yeah, I mean, I, I think Icon's sort of good and bad. I, I, I don't think he's going to hurt the stock, but I don't think, I don't think Apple stock needs Icon at all. Okay, uh, next question is, do you have any thoughts of Google and, on Google and SanDisk ahead of earnings? Yeah, okay, so Google, uh, I've de-emphasized. I still think, again, it's one of my favorite long-term positions. Again, I'm just a little cautious, although I'm getting to the point from a calendar perspective where I need to start building some Google back up because I want to be in Google ahead of what I believe is going to be much stronger Motorola sales. Um, the only, here's the thing I'm concerned about. Um, there, there is a lot of talk that a lot of advertisers have, have allocated a lot more money to Facebook than Google in the last uh, few months. Um, so there, there is a chance that Google does not report a great report. Um, now, as, as aside from a lot of people who would freak out and sell and panic on Google, I, I really would love it if Google missed earnings by like 50 or 70 or cents or a buck. And I would love it if Google dropped like another 60 or 70 or 80 or even 100 points and I'd be all over it, I'd buy them. Um, but I, I'm, you know, I'm, I, I'm not sure that Google really has a great quarter this quarter, um, and I'm kind of hoping they kind of they miss like they did last quarter. Um, as far as Sandisk, I think it's going to be huge. I think I think Sandisk is like Micron. 
I think both those companies have a, a, just a ton of stuff happening for them. And uh, I would be surprised if SanDisk doesn't have another kind of blowout quarter like they did last quarter. Although the weird thing is SanDisk stock, stock has not benefited from their blowout quarter last quarter. Um, I, still, I still think SanDisk has a good chance to go to 75 maybe even $85 though. Um, but I, I like SanDisk in front of the quarter much more than I like Google. I would love that if Google had one, one more kind of muted to poor quarter uh, and give me some weakness to buy in on. Okay, next question is, if the Fed closes off the liquidity nozzle, how will tech fare, at least you know, relative to the S&P? Do you think tech will do worse? No, I think longer term it'll do better. I think, I mean, it's going to hit everything. I mean, if it, but here's, the, here's the, again, my thesis has been um, perverse conditions create perverse outcomes. And so I've never really been, a, now I was a fan of zero interest rates in 2009, 2010. I, th I think the Fed should have raised rates to somewhere between 1% and 1.5% like a year and a half ago. Um, and, and so I actually think a lot of stocks will do way better once interest rates are still exceedingly low, but not at zero. So because then think about it, and I got, I've written a ton on this, part of, part of my, my, my bull case, which, which has been very contrary to, to the naysayers, and I've been right and they've been wrong, is that Fed, until the Fed gets too tight, which would be at least three or 400 basis points higher, um, there's still a massive amount of stimulus out there. And, and again, I think a rate of one or 1.5 percent is almost more stimulative than zero interest rates. So, but, but the initial shock, you know, if, if they were to raise rates 50 basis points and take off QE, you know, the algos are going to kick in and they're going to they're going to create some selling. Um, but I actually think tech does better. Uh, at one or two percent interest rates than I think it does at zero. Okay, folks, um, that closes our presentation out. Sean, once again, thank you very much for your time. And as a reminder, we will send Thanks, out the yes, we will send the replay out to everybody. So you don't have to email us or anything. We will send it to you.